So today I am going to talk to you about, well, this is, an edit, this is a title that would, you may not know much about, but this has something to do with electromagnetics and of course, it turns out optics. Uh, so let me also at this point add my congratulations to the Department of Optoelectronics uh, at the University of Kerala on its Silver Jubilee. Now, the title of my talk comes from a modern proverb, probably from the 1930s. If you can't ride two horses at once, what are you doing in a circus? Some of you may have actually seen something like this. And this is actually from India. Hmm? Now, professors at major research institutions obviously do that. They often ride two horses at the same time. But do they do that while straddling a fence? That feat is exemplified by surface waves. A surface wave is a frequency domain entity whose propagation is guided by the interface of two dissimilar materials. There are, these are both, these, both of these materials are horses of different colors altogether, okay? And there is a fence in between the interface. Now, what happens is that a surface wave is bound to that interface. It is sensitive to changes in the constitutive properties near the interface, and its wavelength is usually shorter than in either of the bulk materials that lie on either side of the interface. So surface waves are very relevant to optical sensing. In fact, that is, I think, their major use uh, for the last about 40 years, okay. They are also useful in optical microscopy, very much so. And there are ongoing discussions in the scientific literature on using surface waves for communications, particularly optical communications inside chips. Some optics researchers think that surface waves are relevant to solar cells also, but after about 10 years of research, I have come to this position that they are not really very relevant to, surface, to solar cells. Surface plasmon waves and surface plasmon polariton waves require a metal as one of the two partnering materials. There are at least four kinds of non-plasmonic surface waves. The uller zenek waves, Diakonov waves, dam waves, and Diakonov dam waves. Both partnering materials are homogeneous for uller zenek and Diakonov waves. The difference is that one of the partnering materials must be dissipative for the uller, that is for the uller zenek waves, and one must be anisotropic, and that is for Diakonov waves. At least one partnering material must be periodically non-homogeneous for TAM waves and for Diakonov TAM waves. Both materials must be isotropic for TAM waves. One must be anisotropic for Diakonov TAM waves. Now, the fields of a surface wave must satisfy the Maxwell equations in each of the two partnering materials individually. In addition, they must satisfy boundary conditions at the interface. Third, the fields of a surface wave must decay far away from the interface. These three requirements must be met, even if one or both partnering materials are non-homogeneous in the direction normal to the interface. This is a key issue. Theoretical analyses of all of these surface waves can be handled with a single matrix-based formalism. No more than four by four matrices are needed for much of this kind of work. Practical configurations to excite surface waves typically require the use of either a prism or a grating or a waveguide. 
Now, let me introduce you to sculpture thin films or STFs for short, as these will figure prominently in this talk. STFs are assemblies of parallel curved nanowires. The diameters of these nanowires are of course on a nano scale for our purposes. They are generally fabricated by physical vapor deposition. The shape of the nano columns is controllable with the stipulation that the nano columns must grow away from an interface, as you can see in this scanning electron microscope image. During fabrication, the shape can be changed almost abruptly within three to five nanometers of growth. This is because STFs comprise clusters, which are of the size between one to three nanometers. And these clusters are the building blocks of sculpture thin films. Here is the SEM image of a periodically non-homogeneous sculptured pneumatic thin film. Its nano columns have essentially a two dimensional shape. They here, they look like S's old time S's, modern S's are upright, these are tilted. The SEM image of a periodically non-homogeneous chiral sculpture thin film is shown here. It comprises three dimensional nano columns, which are helical in shape. Both of these types of STFs have been used in actual experiments for surface wave propagation. Now, back to surface plasma and polariton waves. We have two materials. Let's take material A to be dielectric, material B to be metal. So if material A is a passive dielectric, it can be isotropic or it can be anisotropic. And we will also say that it is either homogeneous, that is its properties are independent of the uh, location, inside, of course, the zone Z greater than zero, or its properties are periodically non-homogeneous along the thickness direction, which, of course, is parallel to the, to the Z axis. Material B, we will take to be a plasmodic metal. Its permittivity scalar has a negative real part, although its imaginary part is positive still. Now, let me show you some results with the dielectric partner being a periodically non-homogeneous sculptured pneumatic thin film. I'm going to show you these results. These were calculated with a free space wavelength of 633 nanometers. The metal was taken to be aluminum in bulk, and, but it need not be, we could have taken calculations we could have made calculations with uh, an aluminum thin film, just that the relative permittivity epsilon super being would have changed. Okay. For the sculptured pneumatic thin film, we took a titanium, we took this material to be made of titanium oxide. I don't say titanium dioxide because although titanium dioxide is evaporated to make the film, what gets made is a film of not TiO2, but TiOx, where X is usually something other than two. And that happens because sculptured thin films, like most other thin films, are in truly systems that are far from equilibrium. The permittivity dyadic of a sculptured pneumatic thin film is specified here. What you can see is that there is a tensor at the very beginning, S, Y of Z, and it's inverse at the end. And this shows that the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this permittivity tensor change as Z changes. Now, locally, the central tensor right here that you see happens to be orthorhombic. But this orthorhombicity, although it is preserved for all Z, it kind of rotates. Think again of going up on a serpentine road up a hill, something of that kind. 
Uh, Miss Smriti has raised her hand. I'm not sure what she wants to ask, but anyhow. Now, for, our, for these calculations, we took very realistic data for this. These data came from one of my colleagues. I'm sorry, somebody has raised their hands and may I know what is it, what's happening? Hello? No, okay. I, okay, I don't know. Okay, I'll continue. All right, so as I said, there's very realistic data were chosen for these sculptured pneumatic thin films. This data actually comes from one of my colleagues, Ian Hodgkinson at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And the data was actually collected in painstaking experiments for the very related columnar thin films. So what you see here is that epsilon A, epsilon B and epsilon C, they are functions of Z. And the reason why they are functions of Z is because the angle chi is a function of Z. And as this angle chi is a function of Z because when the film is being made, the vapor at, which is used to deposit a thin film rotates about the Y axis. And it rotates about the Y axis for this case in a periodic fashion that you can see in the equation down below. Now, we can calculate for this and we will find we find that there are multiple results possible. Let's see here, why am I? Multiple results possible. So as a function of psi, psi is the angle in the xy plane. And since there is fourfold symmetry, we need to consider psi going only from zero to 90 degrees. Okay, so this is the interfacial plane. And what we find is that there are three different solutions. Okay. Now, what are those three different solutions? One solution that's in blue goes from zero to 36 degrees only. And the other two solutions, they go all the way from zero to 90 degrees. So this means that between zero and 36 degrees, we can have three different surface plasma and polariton waves propagating. Whereas between 36 and 90 degrees, we have two different surface plasma and polariton waves propagating. Now, both these, these surface plasma and polariton waves, they have different phase speeds. And the reason they have different phase speeds is very clear in the, in the, uh, in the panel that is on the left of you. And that is because Q, which is the wave number, real part of Q, okay, it turns out to be different for the three waves, okay. The attenuation of these three waves is also different and that is contained in the right panel on your screen, the diagram for the imaginary part of Q. So not only are the phase speeds and the attenuation difference of these uh, three surface plasma and polariton waves, but it turns out that their fields are also different. So let me show you here. Let me show you at psi equal to zero, at which point all three modes exist. Now, what you see here are the plots of the, of the fields on the metal side and on the dielectric side. The dielectric is the sculpture pneumatic thin film, okay? And you can see the components of the X Y and Z uh, uh, of the electric field and the X, Y and Z components of the magnetic field. Mm? And they seem to be varying smoothly. They are maximum at the interface of the metal and the SNTF, okay? And they seem to kind of vary smoothly here. These are the usual kind of SPP waves that you will find in the literature. What is unusual 
or was at least unusual until about 14, 15 years ago, uh, was to find that there is a second SPP wave also possible. And if you look at its field plots, you will see that on the middle side, a smooth decay, just exactly as for the first SPP wave. But on the, on the SNTF side, things are different. You can see that there is a decay, but the decay is episodic. It is as if there is a decaying function, an exponentially decaying function that is multiplied by a sinusoidal function. And this sinusoidal function comes from the periodicity of the sculptured pneumatic thin film. So there is a decay as indeed there must be because that is requisite for a surface wave. But that decay is not monotonic. It is episodic. It is sinusoidal. There is an envelope there that you can see. What happens for the, uh, for the next one is even more interesting, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the field on the dielectric side is not maximum at the interface. It is maximum somewhat away from the interface. This is very important for optical sensing applications. So this is something really, something really interesting here that you see with the third one. That is that there is a decay, but the decay is much slower than for the second wave. So this means that we can, by changing the periodicity of the dielectric material, we can actually engineer the fields in such a way that we can have three or four or five or six uh, maxima. And when we have those maxima, then those maxima can be used for sensing three or four or five or six different types of materials, or at least that is what our hope is. So all I showed you was theory. This had to be confirmed experimentally. And the experimental confirmation, for experimental confirmation, we had to turn towards, well, an experiment. And in this particular case, something called a prism coupled configuration was used. This experiment was conducted at the National Taipei University of Technology by another one of my colleagues, Yi Jun Jen. So what he did was he fabricated a metal sculptured pneumatic thin film combination for an ex using uh, the usual vapor deposition techniques, okay? And what I did was to make the necessary calculations and then we made these measurements. Then we uh, compared our results. So what happens in the prism coupled configuration is that you take a prism as the material through which light will hit the dielectric metal interface, okay? And you can see in this diagram from the left side, there is an incident beam. It gets refracted into the prism. It hits the prism metal interface at an angle theta, in, theta inc. Then it gets reflected and then it gets reflected out into air where you actually measure the intensity. On the other side of the prism metal interface, you can see the metal is a thin film and then there is the dielectric partner. So the surface plasmon polariton wave, if it is excited, will be guided by the planar interface of the dielectric and the metal. The dielectric we take to be sufficiently thick to not make it semi-infinite but we make it to be sufficiently thick that the fields of the SPP wave that are excited would decay sufficiently that there would be no transmission into air on the other side. So here are results that you can see, okay? The experimental results are shown on the left side, the theoretical results on the right side, okay? And for the red curves, the incident beam was p-polarized or uh, parallel polarized. And for the black curves, the incident beam was s-polarized or perpendicularly polarized. Now, what you see is that these absorptance curves, 
they have certain maxima. And I have marked the locations by P when you see the maxima on the absorptance curve for the P wave, where you have maximum absorptance and it's the local maximum, but you will also have uh, the, ex the excitation of uh, surface plus one polar eton wave. Similarly, on the black curve, you will find that there is one S right almost in the middle here, okay, S here. And this tells you that there too, a surface plus one wave was excited. So how do we know that there was a surface plus one polariton wave excited? Well, what we did was we actually used two different sculptured pneumatic thin films. One was three periods thick, the other was four periods thick, the period of course being the same in both films. Those three peaks that I identified, they did not change. When we changed the three period dielectric material with the four period dielectric material. What that means is that these fields, that these peaks corresponded to waves, to surface waves that were highly localized to the interface. And then we conducted eigenvalue analysis, which confirmed that conclusion. Let me show you another example. Here we have a chiral sculpture thin film, which you may recall has a three-dimensional morphology. Okay. And what you will notice is that these that this morphology is almost like the S shapes, except of course S's are in two dimensions, and this one is like an equiangular spiral morphology. Again, we can make calculations for this case, and the calculations are shown here when for actual materials, okay. And what you notice is that there, there were, for this particular set of material, for this particular set of constitutive parameters, we found there could be as many as five SPP waves. We have subsequently done measurements and results. We have obtained theoretical results where we could get up to 15 of these surface plus one polariton waves. But in the literature preceding our work, you would find that there is only one possible. And that is because in the literature, the dielectric material is assumed to be homogeneous, whereas we have a periodically non-homogeneous dielectric material. Now, experiments, we need experiments. So for this, again, we conducted this experiment and this, as it turns out, was taken, was uh, conducted in my own laboratory. Again, we have a prism coupled configuration. There is a prism, there is a metal film, and there's a dielectric material. And the dielectric material in this case is a chiral sculpture thin film. Now, here I'm going to show you results that were obtained. Uh, that, that were obtained with either a three period film or a four period film. And what you can see are two places where there is an S mark. And right, right there you would say that the dip is that this is a dip in the reflectance the dips coincide, whether they are for the three period film or the four period film. And that is a strong indication that we have the excitation of a surface plus one polariton wave. In this particular example, that the experiment was done, the film was made of magnesium fluoride. Okay. And we very clearly obtained the excitation of two surface plus one polariton waves. And this is exactly as the theory had told us. Okay. Now, what we did next was an experiment that we, that, that colleagues of mine and I conducted here at Penn State, Tom Malouk's group in chemistry. Okay. 
we were at that time investigating the use, the potential use of surface plasma and polariton waves for harnessing solar energy in a photovoltaic solar cell. I have to tell you in advance that that turned out to be a failure because it turns out that SPP waves really do not contribute anything significantly to a solar cell. But the experiments that we conducted were very, very useful experiments. So what you see here is theory on one side and experiments on the other side. Okay. Okay. Actually, yeah. And they were done both for P polarization and for S polarization. And this time we used a grating coupled configuration. Okay. The reason why we used a grating coupled configuration is because it prevent it allows us not to use a prism and therefore direct illumination from air is, is enough to excite these SPP waves, okay? So in the leftmost panels, you can see lines and each one of these lines is a family of SPP waves that can arise as a function of wavelength, free space wavelength. And the angle of incidence is theta that you can see on the, in, these, in these. And you see those lines. So these are actually lines that are predicted by Bragg's law when applied to a grating. The two panels on the right side, in the middle panel, what you see are experimental data. In the rightmost panel, what you will see is theoretical data and look, you can see the presence of the lines on the left panels in these two panels. And of course, many of these lines actually coincide. In this particular case, we had used not a chiral STF or an SNTF. We had used an ordinary Rugate filter that was made of silicon oxynitride where the uh, relative contribution of oxygen and nitrogen was varied periodically. And the theory and the experiment, the coincidence between them is simply marvelous. We went on actually to use this whole idea in a planar optical concentrator. And what you will notice is in this planar optical concentrator is the purple region, the purple region can, has a grating in it, okay? So this, is, uh, this allows the excitation of, uh, of surface plasma waves is in the, in the, with the grating coupled configuration. And we have, we were able to actually measure the current output of this solar cell. And you will notice that without the gratings, Okay, on the left side of the graph, okay, the current density is about three point something milliamps per centimeter square. Whereas with the grating, the current density has increased to roughly three times that value. I think, I think it was about 2.5 if I remember correctly. It was just about 2.5 times. The current density has increased. So this means that the idea of a surface plasmon polariton wave can be used for planar optical concentrators, but the amount of enhancement that you get, a factor of about three, may not be any more significant. It was certainly considered significant in about 2014, 2015 time frame, And the reason why that was important is because at that time, solar cells were still very expensive, certainly more expensive than they are today. And so it was thought that by using planar optical concentrators, we could actually bring down the cost of solar cell modules, okay? But today that doesn't seem to be very necessary. A factor of three is not a big deal, okay? So let me summarize up to now what I have talked to you about. For SPP waves, the number of SPP waves modes is one when the dielectric material turns out to be homogeneous. 
which is usually the case in the literature. But we can, if we use a non-homogeneous dielectric material, particularly if it is periodic, that's what we have investigated in great detail, the number can be more than one, okay? And also this number depends on the, whether the dielectric material is anisotropic or isotropic. And if it is an isotropic, then it will depend on the anisotropy in the interface plane, because then it can be dependent on the direction of propagation in the interface plane. Secondly, the polarization state, which is considered to be definable as the p-polarization state in most, in, in much of the literature, it turns out here we cannot always define the polarization state. If you look back at the field plots, you would find that that is not possible because the field configuration changes as the distance z from the interface changes. Let me say more at this point about applications. I've already talked about sensors and I've already talked about communications a little bit. That application certainly represents uh, uh, a future direction that I think uh, many people in optics should be pursuing, but I don't think it has been pursued to the extent it should be. Now, as far as solar cells, the whole idea was that if you excite the surface plasma on polariton waves, they will lead to higher electric fields in the dielectric material, which indeed is true, okay? And because of those higher, di higher electric fields, there will be more absorption. And if there would be more absorption and the dielectric material was photovoltaic, uh, then you would have a higher current density. Well, that is not wrong. That is generally true. The something called the optical short circuit current density is in fact enhanced whenever a surface plasma on polariton wave is excited. But the problem is that the solar cell spectrum goes all the way from about uh, 1000 nanometers, roughly speaking, to about 400 nanometers in wavelength. And no interface can excite, can, can have surface plasma and polariton waves excited at all of those wavelengths, just not possible. In fact, our detailed calculation showed that yes, surface plasma and polariton waves are excited, and yes, they are excited at discrete wavelengths, but the amount of change they made the absorption although high at those wavelengths, when we averaged over the solar spectrum, it was very little. It was on the order of 0.2%. That is not worth it. Now, let me show you a little bit more about surface plasmonics here. Okay, in terms of uh, surface multiplasmonics, in terms of application to sensing, however, okay. So you see a prism coupled configuration here, standard. You will find that in most labs nowadays in optics, okay. We used a dense flint glass prism and we had a dense flint glass substrate. Uh, and then on top of this uh, substrate was deposited an aluminum thin film about 30 nanometers. And on top of it, was a chiral sculpture thin film deposited made of lanthanum fluoride, actually LAFX. We, we certainly evaporated LAF3. What was deposited was LAFX. We never really determined what X was. Now let's look at this. The blue plot that you see is when water, pure distilled water infiltrates the chiral sculpture thin film, which is of course very porous. Okay, and you can see in the blue plot, reflectance minima that are, that are marked as one and two. Now, when we replace the water by sucrose solutions, then you see the red curves that come up and the locations of the minima actually shift. And so in this particular case, we could excite two SPP wave modes, okay, and 
both of them shifted when water was replaced by a sugar solution. One of my students, Patrick McAtee, is still working on this, and he's, he is trying to, uh, at this point, uh, couple this idea with uh, artificial, with machine language, machine uh, language, and, and learning. Okay, so he's doing that. Hopefully, in about a year's time, it will be all done. Now, <clears throat> let me come to non-plasmonic surface waves. And here, the example that I'm going to show you is of the Diakonov 10 waves, for which both materials are dielectric, but material A, which was dielectric before for SPP waves, remains so, and it can still be an isotropic, okay? But material B, we will take no longer to be a metal, but instead, we will take it to be a dielectric material. And for simplicity, we will say, that the imaginary part of the permittivity of this material B is zero, or at least it's negligibly small, okay? The real part, because this is a dielectric material as opposed to a plasmonic material, the real part is positive now. So consider this interface. Uh, this is an interface of a sculptured pneumatic thin film and an isotropic dielectric material, okay? The calculations were made by assuming that the SNTF is made of titanium oxide. And once again, what you see are, okay, solutions that were found of the dispersion equation. So here, one thing that I have to point out is that since we assumed that both materials have negligible absorption, that means the wave number is purely real which means that there is no attenuation. Of course, that is impossible. There will be some attenuation, but we will have long, very long range propagation here, okay? The second thing that you will notice is that from zero to about 10 degrees, there are two solutions. Then from about, from 10 degrees to about 68 degrees, there is one solution. And then from 68 to 90, there is no solution. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is telling us is that unlike SPP waves, when we can more or less say that if an SPP wave were to be excited, it will be excited practically, you will at least have one SPP wave along any direction of propagation in the interphase plane. Here you can have none or one or more than one that's possible. Okay. Then similarly, we made calculations with the chiral sculpture thin film and the dielectric material, isotropic dielectric material. And in this case, we again found that there were as many as in this for uh, five solutions possible, okay? None of these solutions uh, actually span the end. Well, one of them does actually, but the four of them do not span the range from zero to 90 degrees, okay? One of them does but only for a very specific choice of the refractive index <laughs> of, the anis of the isotropic partnering material, okay? Other than that, there are differences and uh, uh, I've already said again that that is long range propagation possible because Q happens to be real, which is impossible in practice, but tells you that uh, the Diakonov time waves can be used for long range propagation. Now, what about the fields? Okay, fields are again going to be bound to the interface. Okay, here, that's what I'm showing you here. But on the isotropic side, they are decaying very exponentially, you know, monotonically, that's how they grow. But on the side of the chiral STF, they are decaying very slowly but again, in an episodic manner, in a sinusoidal manner, okay? So it is as if the field amplitude as a function of Z is made, of the product, mm -hmm. made up of the product of two factors. One of them is exponential and the other one is sinusoidal. So what we did next was to conduct an experiment to verify the existence of these waves. So, until this experiment was conducted, the, the knowledge that such waves can exist was entirely 
theoretical. So here is the result of the experiment uh, in the prism coupled configuration. And what we did was we changed the chiral STF. We looked at four, five, and six period chiral STFs, okay? And we plotted reflectance and you can see that at about 57 degrees theta incident, okay, for the red, blue, and black curves that there is a dip and that these dips lie between in a, in a range of about one degree. This according to our calculations tells is uh, indicative that we have been able to excite one Diakonov dam wave. Okay, that's what it tells us. When the same experiment was repeated, but with the grating coupled configuration, okay, again, you can see that the total transmittance in this case that was calculated, because remember, there is no metal here, so there is practically no absorption, okay, practically. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the total transmittance that was measured, again, for five, six, and seven period uh, films, the, the dips happen to coincide at about an incidence angle of 18 degrees. And again, our calculation showed that that is where, how it should be. Can we use this for sensing? Can we use this for sensing? So we actually did not conduct an experiment for that. We would like to do that, but various reasons we didn't, but we could certainly do a theoretical study. Okay, it turns out. And what you see is that for psi equal to zero, Okay, NL is the reflective index of the infiltrant fluid. Okay, what you can see is that uh, uh, the angle at which the, 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 the surface plasmon wave is excited, I'm sorry, the Diakonov time wave is excited, it changes. And that tells us that you can actually use this for sensing. Lastly, let me talk to you about Diakonov waves. And in particular, I will talk to you about active Diakonov waves. So in this case, what we have is material A, which is isotropic dielectric, but material B is a uniaxial dielectric. That is a composite of an active material and a passive material. So for our calculations, we chose material A to be a lossless dielectric. For material B is a composite material comprising aligned cylindrical inclusions with an active die between the inclusions. And when the volume fraction of the active die is about 0 0.4, the Diakonov wave exists for propagation angle in the interface plane between 50 and 90 degrees. And you will notice that it attenuates during propagation. Okay, when the volume fraction of the active die is 0 0.58, the Diakonov wave amplifies. That's an interesting thing. It actually amplifies for all psi between zero and 90 degrees. So when the volume fraction of the active die is 0 0.8, it turns out that the Diakonov wave exists for all psi and also amplifies during propagation. This means that we can actually have surface waves that, who's, that, that, not on, that of course, usually will uh, decay with propagation, but we can create conditions whereby they can actually enhance while propagating, enhance in magnitude, in amplitude while propagating. Now let me talk to you a little bit about how to compound surface waves. So here is, a, here is an example that I will talk about, that I'll talk about mostly. Material A, this is a silicon oxy nitride rucate filter that we saw some time back in this talk, okay and there are nine periods of it, okay. Then material B is a chiral STF made of titanium oxide, and you have also seen that in, in the previous parts of this talk. But in between them, we put a material C, and that is simply homogeneous glass, okay. 
just ordinary glass of refractive index 1.6. Okay. Now, as the thickness of the central layer increases, what we will notice is that Q, the wave number of this compounded guided wave increases. This wave is jointly guided by the two interfaces. Okay. The interface between materials A and C and the interface between materials C and B. So its propagation characteristics can in fact be modified quite easily by changing the central layer. So Takayama, who was at that time uh, with, uh, with Barcelona and his group, they actually conducted an experiment in which they took a uniaxial dielectric material and they interposed it between silver and an isotropic dielectric material. And in this way, they were able to couple surface plasmon for ariton waves excited by one interface, guided to be guided by one interface, and Diakonoff waves that could be guided by the other interface. And they were able to compound these waves together. So what they found was that when they decompose the fields of this jointly guided wave into P-polarized and S-polarized components, they tried to identify the energy content associated with the surface plasmon polariton wave and with the Diakonoff wave. And over a distance of 102 wavelengths, free space wavelengths, they found that the Diakonoff wave and the SPP wave, they interchange energy. This result shows that different kinds of surface waves can be converted into each other. And that is certainly a very exciting prospect that people like well, Takayama now is with the Danish Technical University. Andre Lavrinenko is there too. And uh, they're conducting experiments in this direction. Can we, can we actually make more complicated systems of this kind? And the answer is yes. We can interpose between materials A and B. Here I'm showing we can interpose three different layers. Okay, we can ma make many. And the more that we make, the more uh, different types of surface waves we can get. Some of them will be pure surface waves, some of them will be compounded surface waves, and that will depend very much on the thickness of the materials in between. Most recently, and this is not actually contained in this talk, we have been able to find a completely new type of a surface wave that we call a white surface wave. And the reason why that is so special is because it turns out that it can be tied to the theory of exceptional points. You may recall that exceptional points have become very commonplace nowadays in the optics literature in, in, in diverse areas such as spintronics and valleytronics and whatnot. So what happens is that uh, you have a non-Hamiltonian system but it, turned out, it turns out that it's, the, its eigenvalues have an algebraic multiplicity that is higher than its geometric multiplicity. The same thing actually happens with surface waves and we can, we can therefore have surface waves that correspond to the exceptional point of a certain matrix and surface waves that do not. And in that way, we can have exceptional surface waves and the usual unexceptional surface waves. All that I have shown you so far in this talk were unexceptional surface waves. Um, I, before I end, I must thank a host of graduate students who were responsible for doing a lot of experiments and a lot of uh, theory. And uh, I also had some interns wonderful interns. And I have had some very strong collaborations. And with that, let me thank you for listening to me and I will be happy to answer questions.